Thank you. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. We trust you're enjoying your time in God's house with God's people. You have certainly made me most welcome, most welcome this week, and thank you for doing that. And I try, pray that our journey will continue to be a rich one, a rewarding one, an exciting one. And I know that will happen because God is part of who we are. You all look beautiful on the outside, on the outside. I pray that you are looking just as beautiful on the inside. I pray that God has blessed you throughout the week. But if you are feeling different on the inside than you appear on the outside, then may God be with you. May God bless you. And you are most welcome at any time to call me, to share with me your concerns, the good and the bad. And I'll be a good listener and I'll pray for you if you need us to. We're going to continue our journey. We're going to continue looking at this beautiful, rich theme the second coming of Christ. It's the most daunting thing when you become the pastor of a new church. Where do you start? What do you preach? What do our people need to hear? What do God's people need to hear? Well, it's the second coming that gets me out of bed every day. If there were no purpose to life, why live? Why be here? Why wake up? We have to have a reason for living. And our reason for living is the future. The past is history. Now is important, but now is going to finish. Now is going to become tomorrow. And so we must have a purpose to life. And I'm thankful that as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have this connection to this beautiful Adventist teaching, the second coming of Jesus. Those of you who missed last week, it has been recorded, and um, you are you're welcome to, to ask for instructions as to how to find it. But today we're going to reach deeper into the book of Revelation to look at this subject, the second coming. I've, I've called the sermon, The Best is Yet to Come. But there's a huge but. Any of you who know the scriptures know that before the best is to come, the worst must come. I want you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. For here in Daniel, we're given a glimpse. More than a glimpse, we're given a powerful picture of the beginning of the second coming. This one great event that causes the second coming to take place is pictured to us in Daniel chapter 12. Before we read that, let's bow our heads. Father God, in your house we open your word. We open our hearts and we open our minds. We pray for your spirit to be our instructor, our teacher. We pray for your spirit to be our preacher. And so, Lord, I pray that as we now study from the word, that you will bless us abundantly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. It says, At that time, Michael, the one like God, will stand up, shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of his people. I want to tell you today that there's someone special watching over you. That is Jesus Christ. He's watching over you from heavenly places. One day I'll take you on a journey through the book of Ephesians and show you what that means, to be in heavenly places with Christ. 
But it says that as he watches over us, he says, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Wow. I'm here to give you good news. Well, I want to tell you, friends, that what I've just shared with you is not bad news. It's not bad news. To know that there is a time of trouble coming and that we can prepare for that, and I'll help you one day to understand what it means to prepare for the second coming. It doesn't mean putting a tin of baked beans behind a rock for the next 25 k's into the wilderness. No. It means preparing the heart for the coming of our Lord. It says there will be a time of trouble as never seen. But notice what it says next. Even at that time, even at that time, your people shall be delivered. I want to say good news for the time of trouble. Because when that mighty time of trouble comes, we know the coming of the Lord is next. The coming of the Lord is close. And so the worst is yet to come. We could be like most people, as that picture there is portraying and become so desperate, so concerned and so anxious about what is happening. But we should never be like that. We should never be like that. We should instead be a person of faith, rejoicing, rejoicing and always trusting in God. That's what Paul says. Regardless of what happens, he says, rejoice always. Always rejoice in the direction of God. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time about that, but that is to come. We are to look towards that. But be mindful of the fact that Christ at that time will deliver his people. What do you see? There's a picture. What do you see? It's a crop, isn't it? It's a crop almost ready for harvest. What do you see? Well, this is what you should see. You should see wheat and you should see tares. That's what happens in any crops. Particularly back then in the days when the, when the Bible was written, there were no pesticides. We can pretty much control weeds today. But back then, weeds could not be controlled. And as you planted a crop, there would naturally be the weeds growing amongst them. But impossible to tell the difference. The devil... When he sows seeds, he sows them pretty close to the truth. It's no good having a $100 green note as the genuine and have a $100 black note as the counterfeit. Everybody's going to know. And this is when the two ripen. Only when the two ripen do you know the difference. They ripen very differently. Here's another picture for you. What do you see? What do you see? You see a flock. A flock of what? Well, what you see is you see a mixed multitude. You see a mixed multitude. Just as there is wheat and tares and you have a mixed crop, so you have a mixed multitude, and that is what they are, sheep and goats. Why have I gone to that trouble to, to give you that illustration of wheat and tares and sheep and goats? Because that's what the reality of life is. There are two groups of people walking the journey of life. There are sheep, or there is wheat, or there are goats and tares. When you delve into the book of Revelation, you will not understand the book of Revelation unless you understand that principle, that God is talking to two groups of people. 
One is a group of believers and the other is a group of unbelievers. One is a group of people who is connected to a church and the other is a group of people who are just connected to the world. I want to show you today that God has the same message for both groups of people, that the second coming is the most important event in their life. Let's have a look at how God does it. Oops, we'll just go back. We'll just go, where did I go? Okay. The second coming is the climactic conclusion of all things. Do you believe it? Praise the Lord, I'm in in the right place. It impacts on everyone, whether of the church or the world. The second coming is going to impact on everyone. Some, Some religious groups will have you believe that the people of the church are going to be taken to heaven and then there's going to be a group left behind. Well, I don't know what Bible they get that from, but certainly not the Bible that I read. Okay, so when you start looking into the book of Revelation, you come across a message called the seven seals. The message called the seven seals is a message to the church, to the believers, to the Christians. Okay, it has no meaning. The message of the seven seals has no meaning to anyone else unless they have a faith in God. It's a message of warning to those who revere or fear God. The seven seals is a message to the sheep. So it's for you guys. It's for me. I'm a sheep and very happy to be one. But well, well done. Well done. I didn't have that courage. The message, the revelation, the seals is contained in Revelation chapter 6 through to chapter 8. Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 to 17 is the description of the first six seals. Now, I'm not going to tell you today what all the seals are. Okay, I don't have that luxury. I want to talk about the second coming today. But the seven seals step us through the history of the Christian church from the time of Christ to the second coming. And when you look into the first seal, it is a rider on a white horse. That is a picture of the church when truth was pure, when everyone kept the Sabbath, when everyone believed in the resurrection of Jesus. Beautiful. But then there's a transition takes place. The next horse you see is a red horse. The second seal is a picture of when the church becomes corrupted. And blood is being shed because some people are standing for the truth. Other people are starting to accept the traditions of man. There is a decline in Christianity. And God foretold that. And next thing it comes to a black horse. The church goes into darkness. There's not many people preaching truth anymore. Truth is being lost. But then sadly... The real colours even become blurred to where the fourth horse is like the fourth beast. It's a nondescript, it's a pale horse. It has no real colours of its own, it's a blend of all these others. And the world becomes, the Christian church becomes very secular, very worldly. No longer aligned to God. And so we move through the journey of the church. And then when you come to the sixth seal, I want you to come with me in particular to the sixth seal. Let's have a look at the sixth seal in Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, the uh, last portion of it is the sixth seal. Starts in verse 12. 
Notice what happens when the sixth seal is being talked about. It says, I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Oh, very different. Very different than the rest. The sixth seal is a seal when it is opened, is introducing to us to, to events in the world that tell us we are close to the end. And the first one is this great earthquake. And then it says, And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. I'm sure it would have lost its figs last night. But notice what it says next, verse 14. Oh, then the sky receded. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains. You've got a picture here of Christians. This is, these, are, these are believers here. These are not the people out there. These are the people who are supposed to have known God. And all of a sudden when these earthquakes come and these lightnings and, and, and the stars fall and then the heavens open, these so-called believers want to hide from the God that they never knew. And they ask, for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. Oh, what a tragedy that a believer has come to that point where they asked to be destroyed because they had their faith all wrong. What a tragedy. What a huge tragedy. You know what, friends? Where are we? Where are we today? Well, we can be fairly accurate. Because the earthquake was in what year? 1755, the earthquake. Who can give me the year of the, the time the sun was blackened? 1780. 1780 and the date? May 19. Who can tell me when the stars fell from, when, from the sky? 1833. Have you got the date? November the 13th. Where are we? That's history, folks. The world has traveled through those events and we are now just sitting waiting for the heavens to recede and for Christ to step out. Wow. What a time to be alive. What a time to be knowing God. What happens next is John, John take, oops, sorry, wrong one. Oh, how do I get back there, folks? How do I get back to where we should be? You can do that. I wish they made these things all the same. I'm a, I'm a simple person. Okay. Right, we'll go through, shall we? All right, here we are. When you come to the end of Revelation chapter 6, something happens. John stops talking about the seals. And he jumps. He jumps to start talking about the 144,000. Why does he do that? Well, you could imagine John on the Isle of Patmos being given that scary picture of all this great evil happening to the, to the Christian church, the demise of the church, you could imagine that he'd start to be a bit afraid and that he, that he would become petrified. And to assure him, God gives him a picture of people who have been delivered, who have been accepted into the kingdom of God. It's a little image 
to build faith and to build hope. And so you can imagine John now, wow, thank you, God. I needed that. You have buoyed up my spirit. And after he has done that in Revelation chapter 7, and we move into Revelation chapter 8 verse 1, you are given a picture of the second coming of Jesus. As far as the seals is concerned, the second coming of Jesus is confined to just one verse. Notice what it says in Revelation 8 verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. All of the angelic force with Christ has departed the Father, have come out on the clouds and have began their descent to the earth. That's all we're told when it comes to the seven seals about the second coming. No more, no less, just that. Jesus is coming. And that's the message to the Christian church, Jesus is coming. Sometime after 1833, Jesus is coming. Let's move on. Let's move on to the story of the goats. The story of the goats. Because the message, to, the message of the seven trumpets is a message to the goats. Because there are a lot of other people in the world. The majority of people in the world are goats, not sheep. But God also holds them accountable. He holds them accountable. And so the message of the seven trumpets is to, uh, is to those who are caught up in the world. It's the message of warning to those consumed by worldly pursuits. Now when we go to the trumpets... Revelation 8 verse 2 right through to the end of chapter 9 basically is telling us the story of the trumpets. And when you understand the story of the trumpets, it is God bringing judgment against those in the world who have messed with Christianity. The first of the trumpets is judgment against those who crucify Christ the people of Israel who reject Jesus and had him crucified and led to the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the first trumpet is dealing with them. Just as the first seal was at the time of just after Christ, so the first trumpet is just after Christ. The second trumpet is judgment against Rome, the power that allowed Christ to be crucified. And we continue to move on through the world. Eventually the secular world is brought into the trumpets and judgment is brought against them. But what I want to note is again there's an interlude. In the midst of the trumpet, John is again given the picture of the people who are delivered. But it's done in a very different way. It's done through the resurrection of the gospel truth in John 10, where a little book is opened. But then when you get into Revelation chapter 11, we're given the power of the two witnesses. We're given the instruction that the temple is to be measured. And these people are... The world should start listening to Christianity. Their salvation is in the message that comes through Revelation 10 and Revelation 11. Powerful how God expresses his love to his people. But then when you come to Revelation 11, you come to the second coming of Christ. The end of the world is the second coming of Christ. The end of the Christian church is the second coming of Christ. It's the same end for all people. 
Let's have a look at Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell and worshipped and worshipped, saying, and here we have this passage where God is, is being exonerated for having accomplished all that he set out to do to bring an end to sin and to deliver God's people. Powerful, powerful passage of scripture. And so here, everybody in the world is affected, is touched and impacted on by the second coming of Christ. Whether you go to church or whether you don't go to church, it's all the same. The second coming is the most important event. Just for a little moment, Revelation chapter 14. Just for a brief moment, we'll look at Revelation chapter 14. This is peculiar to us. There will be no one else preach this. There will be no one else tell this. This is peculiar to us. But before John goes into the deep theological message of Revelation 14, he is first of all given a message of hope. Don't we love that? Messages of hope. Revelation 14 verse 1, again you're given a picture of this 144,000, of those who are delivered. But then, when you get into Revelation 14 verses 6 through to 13, you have what we know well, the three angels message. This is the attempt by God to alert the world to the nearness of the coming of Christ. And that's why you and I are here. That's the reason we exist, is to preach that message. We are the voice of God. We are the messengers of God. That's our mission. Notice what happens now in Revelation 14. After those three angels' messages are preached, what happens next? Come with me. Revelation 14, 14. I've heard a lot of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. I've heard a lot of it in my time as a Seventh-day Adventist believer. I've, never, I've very rarely ever heard the next few verses shared from the book of Revelation. But look at what they are. Revelation 14, verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. I looked and behold a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, Michael of Daniel 12 having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Wow. Wow. The next thing we look forward to is the second coming of Christ. It is the heart of the message of Revelation 14. Why preach the three angels' message if Christ is not coming? That's the reason we preach the three angels' message. I want to take you now to what the heart of the second coming is all about. It's a subject that needs to be preached, needs to be understood. But what is the reason for the second coming? Why the second coming? Well, I want to take you to Revelation chapter 19. And I want to have you to understand what is the reason behind the second coming. Come to Revelation 19. 
and look at verses 6 to 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunders, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What I'd like is I'd like a mum and a dad and a daughter to come and stand over here. It can just be a man and a woman and a, and a young lady. It doesn't have to be a family. But I'd like a man and a woman and a young lady to come and stand here, please. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you difficult questions. I need a man, a woman, and a young lady here. So if you stay there, now I would like a man and a woman and a young man to come over here. Okay? A man, a woman, and a young lady, a young man to come here. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. I'm not going to do anything to you that's going to embarrass you. In John chapter 14, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, believe in me, believe also in God. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and when I go and have prepared a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you can be also. Okay? So right now, here's Jesus. This young man is Jesus. This is his household. Okay? Over here, this young lady is you. Is you. A young person, a family who believes in Christ. 2,000 years ago, this young man, you come for a walk with me, he came down to this earth to where this young church, young person was, and he died on a cross. And at that point in time, he said to this young lady, if you accept me, I would like to be married to you. I would like to have an eternal relationship with you. And so there was the betrothal. There was the engagement. Now, in Jewish culture, that's it. They don't see each other for a long time. The young man would come back to his household and he would say, well, mum and dad would have actually gone on that journey as well in a Jewish household, okay? Because if he was courting the young Jewish lady, the same principle applies. The family would go to the family and would say, can I have permission for my son to marry your daughter? And the family would say yes. So then this family would come back. The son and the father would get busy. And they would build a room on the house. Depends how rich the family were. That might take six weeks. It might take six years. But that family would continue to build that house. Meanwhile, that family doesn't know how long it's going on. But she is betrothed to him. When, when they have finished the extensions and the house is ready to be lived in, then the whole family... Come with me. The whole family would, oops, be careful of the cord. The whole family would come over here and there'd be a little celebration here. But then the whole lot of us will go over there. Okay, let's go over there because that's where the bride will live. The bride will live in the husband's place. He will never reside over there. He will live there. That, my friends, is a picture of Revelation 19. 
That is a picture of the wedding ceremony. Christ came down from heaven. He died on a cross. And he pledged himself to us. And he said if we accept him, we will become his bride. Christ then ascended to heaven to prepare a place. Sometime in the future, he's going to fulfill his promise. He's going to return to that household and he is going to receive the bride and he is going to take the bride. That's what the second coming is all about. The second coming is about ratifying the engagement. We're only engaged to Christ, friends. That's all we are. We are engaged to Christ, waiting to be his forever. That will only ever happen at the second coming. You can sit down if you like. Thank you for being part of the demonstration. So yes, when we accept the sacrificial offering of Jesus on the cross as our means of conquering our sin, we become betrothed to Christ. We become betrothed to Christ, engaged to Christ. Christ makes the promise to marry us, to be eternally ours. And then this betrothal is officially validated at the second coming, the wedding banquet. That's what the second coming is all about. Beautiful, isn't it? Powerful thoughts, beautiful rich thoughts. Very, very soon, his sheep will delight in the bountiful riches. Those other words are a little bit missing there, I'm not sure. They will delight in the bountiful riches of eternal glory. And by the way, that's not a photo of Australia. That's a photo of the beautiful sheep country in the south of New Zealand. It's the closest I could get to heaven. Yes, friends. I just want to say to you, the day is coming when we will be in glory, when we will be in the eternal presence of a God who loves us, of a Jesus who died for us, that day is quickly coming. C.S. Lewis said it like this. There are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. Wow. Beautiful thought, isn't it? Moving off into the sunrise. Or it could be said this way. Always remember that your present situation is not your final destination. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. If the present were heaven, phew, I don't want to be there. But the best is yet to come. I just want to say to you to make the most of today. Enjoy today. It's a day that God has given you. But look forward in hope. Look forward in faith. As John was receiving these messages, Jesus gave him the picture of the 144,000, of those standing on the sea of glass. That's what we should look forward to. To help us more understand the journey, next week I will be away. I'll be at the Leadership Summit. We're going to have Lyndon presenting to us next week. But the following Sabbath, I will take you through the I will promises of Jesus. The same person who wrote the book of Revelation wrote the Gospel of John. And from the Gospel of John, we have some powerful I will promises. That will be my next message. And then to wrap up the second coming, the week after, I will talk to you about the moon and the second coming. Now that one's going to intrigue you. What's the moon got to do with the second coming? But that's the journey I plan to take you on over the next couple of times that I preach. But please, please, be ready. Be ready for the second coming. Excite yourself about these things. Look at verse 9 of Revelation 19. 
Then he said to me, Right, blessed. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You have been called. You have been invited. The invitation is not yet to come. The invitation to the marriage supper has already been given. You have already received it. I pray that you will be writing your RSVP. I pray that you will be writing your response and it will be to say, yes, Jesus, I will be there. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the beauty of your words, so full of counsel. But I thank you that as a people we understand it. I thank you that as a people we know what it means. And I thank you that we can believe it with all of our hearts. So dear Lord, please take these sheep from this place. Grant them a blessed time here on this earth while we're here. But please Lord, take them all to the kingdom soon. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know Life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the come assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Because he lives. Oh, loving Jesus, you must be getting excited. Because all those things you conveyed to John 2,000 years ago, you can say, yes, done, yes, done, that's happened, that's happened. All the things you said to Daniel, they've all happened. And we are just waiting for the sky to be rolled back and for you to come. We should be getting excited too. So please, Lord, excite our hearts about your soon return. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.